Hello, and welcome to our Automotive Trends 2024 Future Driven Forum. I am Hillary Kane, Senior Vice President of Policy here at the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. I am joined today by a wonderful group of panelists from Qualcomm, Texas Instruments, and Honda uh, for what I am confident will be an incredibly insightful conversation. But before uh, we jump into that conversation, let's take a little look back at what each of the companies joining us today showed at this year's CES in Las Vegas. Roll the tape. So the key concept for the concept car basically is the personalization. And on top of that, uh, what we have brought in here is a 55 inch display, pillar to pillar display here, which is divided between the main and the passenger. Mm -hmm. A passenger display actually can have a privacy control so that the driver is not distracted. That's good because now the passenger can occupy himself exactly. or herself. The baby monitoring, by the way, is a critically important safety feature, exactly. right? Because you're monitoring the baby while you're in the car. You don't have to actually look backward and you know cause uh, some distraction there. Buy a car today, you will get a 300 pages uh, user manual. Oh my gosh, yes. And who reads that? Exactly. With the generative AI, you can actually talk to the assistant and in a conversational way and basically get uh, a help from the assistant. Hey, Snapdragon, I'm trying to adjust the steering wheel. How do I do that? You need to pull the lever down and grip the steering wheel. Yeah, as you can see, the assistant basically got a summary of that. Hey, Snapdragon. What is that alert on my dashboard? Problem appears, the battery charger coupler temperature too hot. So all these uh, diagnostic codes are available on the cap. Amazing. at CES and we're going to go into the stand and we're going to look at two amazing new concept vehicles that Honda showed today. This is the Honda Zero Series Space Hub. So what you have here is a thin, energy-dense battery which maximizes space for the people within the vehicle and the battery has a lot of really interesting features. The Honda Zero Series will be able to charge from 15% to 80% in 50 minutes. Oh yeah, that's fast. The Honda Zero Series is aiming to have just 10% battery degradation after 10 years, which should wow. lead the market. It's got vastly more interior space than I expected to see. It's huge. Incredible. So this is the Honda Zero EV Series saloon concept. Look at this. Are you kidding me? It's completely buttonless, right? So everything's touch screens and heads up displays. I love this. This is a stunning vehicle, both visually and technologically. According to Jeff and Honda, we can expect a production vehicle like this in 2026, which in automotive terms is like the day after tomorrow. So super exciting. The lines on this thing are stunning. Beautiful vehicle. We're at Texas Instruments here at CES. One of the things that they're working on in a whole suite of connectivity and automation technologies is the ability to use radar to detect people inside the vehicle. Every year, small children die because they're left in a car that overheats. And so to have this radar sensing technology recognize and alert is great technology that will definitely save lives. So tell us a little bit about software-defined vehicle. To me, in a software-defined vehicle is software detecting the capabilities of your car. Right, as opposed to in the past, we might think of hardware, hardware. right? The OEM can detect a potential defect or condition that even before the customer knows. Right, that's the biggest advantage. They can fix that over the air using the software approach. We're looking now at different new different applications like uh, dynamic ground projection where you can actually communicate to pedestrians via projection on the floor. The main adoption has, has been uh, coming from the safety perspective.
Wow, I, I love it. That is very exciting stuff. Uh, so let me now introduce our guests. Joining us today are Mark Granger, Senior Director, Qualcomm Automotive Cockpit Solutions, Fern Yoon, Director of Automotive Systems, Texas Instruments, and Jeff Beck, Senior Director of Federal Affairs at Honda. Mark, Fern, Jeff, thank you for being here today. Okay, thank so, you yeah, thank you. So CES uh, never disappoints. Uh, this year was certainly uh, no different. And as we just saw, each of your companies displayed incredible uh, cutting edge vehicle technology. Um, so let's spend a few additional minutes celebrating that, celebrating your company, celebrating uh, what you exhibited this year. And, and Mark, maybe we could start with you and, and just a couple of sentences, if you could tell us a little bit more about what Qualcomm displayed at CES this year. Sure, great. So yeah, I mean, it was a super exciting um, event. Uh, and I think we brought a lot of great technology to bear. Um, you know, at Qualcomm, it all starts with, uh, as we call it, the digital chassis, um, which is uh, our overarching umbrella of our uh, cockpit solutions, our uh, ride platform for ADAS and autonomy, connected services, as well as then all the connectivity modem Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and whatnot. And so specifically, uh, you know, the key points, generative AI on the edge. Uh, so edge LLM and some great use cases that, that was demonstrated in our custom vehicle. Um, we showed real implementation of SDV. And I think we're going to talk uh, a bit later about SDV. Um, connected services, as I mentioned. So uh, bringing to bear some partnerships um, into uh, uh, the connected service uh, ar um, arrangement. And, you know, frankly, on ADAS, showing how we're progressing, maturing, and bringing a scalable solution um, to market. And to kind of wrap it all together, um, we showed the latest developments on our Flex platform, which is the fusion of uh, cockpit and ADAS onto a single device. So yeah, it was a great show. Incredible. Uh, Jeff, what about Honda? Sure. So the key thing that Honda showed at this year's CES was the Honda Zero Series. Now, when we were designing the Honda Zero Series, we thought back in, you know, traditionally, EV buyers have been asked to design their life around their EV. And with the Honda Zero Series, we were wondering, can we switch that? Can we design an EV that works around someone's life? Mm -hmm. And we brought it down to three ideas, which is thin, light, and wise. And what do those mean? Uh, the Honda Zero Series, which is a platform, it's not going to be just a, a single car, has advanced battery technology that allows for a more energy-dense battery. It has advanced software that both evolve around the driver and offer better solutions and includes AI features throughout the vehicle on the safety side and on the driver usage side in order to maximize what the vehicle can provide for the driver. And even more exciting, the first Honda Zero Series will be available in 2026. Incredible. All right, Fern, what did Texas Instruments have on display? Uh, we displayed quite a bit uh, of technology surrounding how we make vehicles safer smarter and more sustainable for, for the future. So think of um, how we help energy conversion from the grid to charging of the vehicles to then um, also moving towards um, enabling the electric vehicle propulsion system, whether that's on the battery management systems, inverters, um, onboard chargers, DC, DC, and then moving into how we make those vehicles safer for all of us on the road. And so think of enabling increasing levels of autonomous driving uh, through multiple different sensor modalities, whether it's radar, camera, ultrasonic, um, a combination or LIDAR and the combination, all of that, um, to enable multiple different ADAS solutions, to then moving towards uh, the concept of uh, software-defined vehicle. Uh, think of the centralization of uh, architecture in, in vehicle trend that's coming up. And we've, uh, we have we certainly spent some time talking about how TI technology is enabling our OEM partners to achieve uh, that vision as well. 
Fantastic. So, so obviously, uh, your three companies were not the only three companies exhibiting at CES, and there were a lot of other exhibits as well. And so I'm interested between what you all were exhibiting and what you saw other companies exhibiting at CES, what are sort of the two top technology trends that you saw in the automotive space? So if you were to sort of define the themes, the technology themes uh, for 2024 in automotive, uh, what, what, what would the top two be? Uh, let's start with uh, Jeff uh, from Honda. Sure, so I have to start with something that we've already said multiple times here, and that's a software defined vehicle or SDV. Uh, it was inescapable on the floor. You saw it on uh, a bunch of different booths. You saw it on advertisements. You heard people talking about it. It was it was absolutely everywhere. Um, and you know we saw a breadth of what a software defined vehicle could be, from the safety side, from the entertainment side, and and really everything in between. Uh, another key takeaway that I had was enhanced mobility. So a lot of of companies in the automotive space. You know, obviously we're we're looking at the car from parking space to parking space, but we're also looking at the entire journey, the last mile, for example. And we saw a lot of different technologies that were able to complete the journey for the individual. And you could see this at Honda's booth. Another item we displayed was the Moto Compacto, which is a small, slightly bigger than briefcase electric scooter that fits in a trunk or fits on public transportation. Uh, but we saw that across the floor. Fantastic. So Fern, uh, what are what are your top two automotive uh, takeaways, technology takeaways from CES this year? Certainly uh, the uh, trend towards uh, vehicle electrification continues on the floor. I think what was interesting on that is um, not just for passenger vehicles, you saw a lot more of that in commercial uh, vehicles and agricultural uh, vehicles as well. So that's certainly something that is exciting to see how we're continuing to to, to grow that sustainability trend across um, the, the, the range of vehicles. The other uh, piece I would agree with Jeff is the software-defined vehicle, um, how different um players in the automotive um, ecosystem is thinking about software defined vehicle, uh, what, 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 what their, their approach and, and why they want to get to software defined vehicle is certainly very interesting. And then of course, um, coupling in the um, AI piece of it, how are we uh, leveraging AI as, as a tool out there to continue to enhance, not necessarily just um, how the user or the driver interacts with um, a vehicle, but also um, the tools that um, the players in the automotive ecosystem can can leverage as part of our development uh, towards a, a a smarter, safer, uh, sustainable vehicle. Fantastic. Does anyone else notice that Fern snuck three in there? All right, Mark, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, you know, I I, I think uh, it's going to sound like repetition, but um, you know. Obviously, AI has been fundamental the past several years, right? And it's well established how AI is transforming ADAS and autonomy, making life more convenient and safer. But specifically, you know, generative AI um, saw it, you know, not just in Qualcomm booth, but all over uh, the place, bringing, you know, rich digital um, experience and assistance into the vehicle. And specifically, you know, at Qualcomm, we're excited because, uh, you know, we're uniquely positioned to bring this to the edge. Uh, so actually running locally, uh, enhancing uh, data privacy, latencies, everything else. So clearly generative AI was a, a big uh, thing that I think will influence the industry for the years to come. Um, the other definitely um, SDV. Um, it's a huge example of the ecosystem that has to come together uh, to enable um, SDV and uh, really make it a reality. Uh, I think it's very well suited as we march into this era of uh, more centralized computing uh, and whatnot that, uh, of course, plays well into to our offerings. So, um, yeah, great show. Great show. Great. So, so thank you for that. So, okay, so we, we have a consensus among the group that software-defined vehicle was a prevalent theme this year at CES. Mm -hmm. um, here's the deal, though. I'm, I think there's probably a little ambiguity, maybe even some confusion out there about what 
is a software defined vehicle. So while we have the three of you here, three experts, um, for, for each of you uh, and for your company, what is a software defined vehicle? So Fern, let's go to you first. Sure, so from our perspective as a semiconductor supplier, uh, we think of software-defined vehicle as a vehicle that um, has a more centralized uh, car architecture that enables, among other things, a, a more synergistic, holistic approach to how software is being developed and deployed and leveraged within a vehicle. And that certainly translates into the electrical architecture of the vehicle. Um, one common uh, trend that we hear quite a bit is zone architecture. Um, the concept of moving from uh, the, the number of ECUs, number one, consolidating the number of ECUs, electrical computer units uh, or electronic computer units in a vehicle into from, let's call it function-based or domain-based into location-based within a vehicle. Uh, to achieve a couple things, a, um, a, a more streamlined software approach that enables um, a over the is more simpler, maybe, maybe simpler is not the right word, but uh, better leveraging the ability to do over the air updates, uh, cloud communication, um, and then also the concept of personalization for, for the drivers. Um, there is a lot more technology um, going into vehicles today. And um, what used to be the concept of a car that was simply a mean to get from place to place has evolved to become something more than just a means of transportation, but you also include um, uh, productivity. You know, how many of us take calls in, um, well, while we're driving or commuting from place to place? And then how many of us have children in the back who then need to be entertained on, on long road trips or, uh, or while we're waiting for, I don't know, in my case, my, my son to wrap up his best, uh, soccer practice and you need a, you know, past time. How do you keep yourself entertained or engaged and productive in, in a vehicle, right? And all of that ultimately translates to, more personalization in a vehicle and, and a more efficient way to do that certainly is the software aspect of it. There is also the idea of how do you continue to um, reduce cost in vehicles and reduce weight um, in vehicle in order to drive better efficiency in vehicles and the concept of zone architecture by um, moving towards location-based ECUs in a car can certainly help with cable reduction. So that translates into weight um, as well as cost. Um, all of these certainly point, I, I look at all of these as roads pointing in towards software-defined vehicle, where we're consistently enabling more and more digital communication throughout the car, where you have anywhere from 100 to 200 nodes in a vehicle today, uh, not all of them are digitally, digitally communicate, uh, connected to one another um, or even software controlled um, from, say, the central control unit all the way to the edge nodes that Mark was referring to. Uh, the concept of software-defined vehicle is, is striving to get all of these connected um, so that it can be uh, controlled and programmed and customized via software. And uh, from our perspective, there's so much technology and, and, and approaches that an OEM can take to address that. Um, and so it's certainly been very interesting as a semiconductor supplier, identifying all of the new technologies we have that, that go hand in hand and enabling that. Okay, perfect, Jeff. So for Honda, a software defined vehicle is, is really at its core, a new way to provide value to, to the customer. Now, as Fern mentioned, Historically, each component has had its own software on a vehicle, and there are many, many different components on a vehicle. With a software-defined vehicle, you centralize that, and you're able to run the car through, through basically the car's software instead of an, an individual piece of hardware software. Uh, and it allows, it allows the car to evolve. It allows the car to adapt to the consumer's needs. Uh, now, I, I want to be clear, switching over to a software-defined vehicle is not a simple, uh, simple task. It, it requires substantial changes to the architecture, 
But because of the ability to update, the consumer is going to see benefit in that they don't just see the benefit of the vehicle when they first purchase it, but can find new value potentially years down the line. Perfect. So, so Mark, how is uh, Qualcomm defining software-defined vehicle? Well, I think uh, you know many of the same uh, sort of themes. Um, clearly, you know one of the central aspects of it is um, you know centralized. Um, compute that can do mixed criticality workloads. But but it's much more than that. It's really the connection all the way up uh, to the cloud, right? Um, and enabling um, new value, as Jeff mentioned, for the consumers, um, because for instance, continually updating and evolving the, the product much beyond what you could do with a bunch of distributed uh, ECUs. But um, it's also offering, and hopefully Jeff will agree, some benefits for the OEMs and the tier ones uh, because they're able to do a vast majority of their software development in the cloud, test in the cloud in virtual environments, uh, harden it, and uh, save time, money, um, and really be able to continually evolve the car uh, over time. Right. And, um, you know, that's where um, there were so many people around the show showing the different aspects from cloud, um, you know, all the way down to the to the hardware components to really allow uh, this vision uh, to happen in the future. Great. So um, whether we're talking about software defined vehicles or artificial intelligence, these are themes that we've seen to some degree at, at previous CES. This wasn't the first time. Mm -hmm. Uh, that these these themes have made an appearance. So I guess I'm wondering, is there anything about this year that feels different to you on some of these key themes than maybe in, in past years? Or is this just more of sort of the same as we've seen uh, previously? Maybe, Mark, we can start with you on this. Does, does sure. it feel different this time around? No, I, I, I definitely believe there's um, kind of a huge difference. I, I believe in past years, uh, um, yep, everyone was saying SDV, 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 uh, right? But even tied to your previous question, what is SDV, right? Um, and uh, a lot of, I'll call it, um, you know, inconclusive definitions of what that is. But, um, you know, uh, ourselves, like like many on the, the, the show floor, um, you know, kind of showed off the full workflow. And I think we were probably a bit unique in having you know, um, our AI hardware in the cloud um, and all this cloud development uh, thing, all the way down to the target hardware and demonstrating how uh, <coughs> an emergency uh, braking application, for instance, can be developed, tested in the cloud, validated, and then very quickly uh, brought down to the target device and, and run. Right. Um, so and I think, frankly, you, you started seeing pieces of that from many different players around the show. Um, and so bottom line, it's 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 really showing real implementations um, this year versus in the past. Uh, it was primarily architectural high level concepts. So. Perfect. Uh, uh, Fern, do you do you agree with that? Does this year feel different to you? Yeah, I certainly agree with Mark. Uh, while the conversation and concept of software-defined vehicles is certainly not new, I think what was very really exciting to see at CES this year is just the next level implementation for how one would achieve this concept of a software-defined vehicle. As Jeff and Mark alluded to earlier, it's not an easy transition, um, and we believe that it's really going to go step-by-step step, uh, with a, a, a where you're going to hit a hybrid model as part of that transition period period to a, a software-defined vehicle. But what was exciting to see this year and um, not just what's shown on the floor, but even the conversations that were had at CES, really a, a deeper level of thought and, and, and probing and understanding around how are we going to make that a reality? And certainly something that we also showcased um, on the floor at, at our booth, um, you know, it's by enabled devices that allow you to configure uh, the properties of a particular function within a car through the cloud um, processors that um, can enable a transfer of information very quickly and seamlessly between 
uh, the vehicle uh, to, to a cloud server, for example, and then the application of that capability uh, for safety applications, uh, for fleet tracking, uh, bat uh, better battery management, just all across the board. I think that's been really interesting and exciting to see that next level of conversation happening because that's where the engineering and the true innovation happens, honestly, is as you get deeper, deeper into how are we going to enable software-defined vehicles? Yeah, no doubt. Jeff, what about, what about you? Does it feel different this year? Yeah, and I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Um, you know, the, the big difference this year is in previous years, we've all seen you know, booths that have had software defined vehicle in a hypothetical sense. In a, you might be able to do this, you might be able to do that. But this year at CES, we saw it in a way that that the customer will eventually see it. Um, and that that was a very big sea change. It wasn't the booths that were stuck in the back with engineers talking to engineers. It was people seeing what they might be purchasing. Uh, the Honda Zero Series is, is a software-defined vehicle and is, uh, in automotive terms, right around the corner. Uh, so that was, was the major change in my eyes. That's, that's great. So we, we've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence during the conversation. I wanna pull on that thread maybe a little bit more um, because there's, there's clearly a lot of uh, interest from media, from policymakers, from consumers, right, about artificial intelligence. And, and my take is that the conversation, um, there's sort of this emerging narrative of skepticism, maybe even fear, and, and we're spending less time, it seems, talking about the benefits of the technology and the opportunities that it offers uh, to consumers. And so I want to take a moment for us to focus there, if we might, and talk a little bit about uh, the benefits that artificial intelligence can bring to vehicles and to drivers and to passengers. And so maybe Jeff, if we could start with you, uh, uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence and benefits. Sure, so I, I think it's important to start off that we're not looking forward to putting AI in vehicles. Artificial intelligence has already been in vehicles and it has been for many years. So uh, people have been enjoying the benefits of this technology for some time. Uh, that being said, I'm still really excited about what the future will bring as AI continues to evolve. Uh, something that we talked about at CES this year is how the AI that we are going to be integrating into our products will be able to evolve around the driver. Now, this is items we've talked about here already today, advanced driver assist systems or, or ADAS, automated driving, um, but it also goes beyond that. It's the ability to evolve the HMI displays to better suit what the driver needs at the time and how that particular driver, the information that they're looking for, or even taking it a step further, once you park the car, it offers last mile solutions. Are you, what's your favorite restaurant? What's your favorite music? How can I find a parking spot that, that works for, for your particular needs? And so what you're gonna see with AI is a continuing evolution of providing the driver with safety, with convenience, and with, uh, with the ability to, to get where they need to go. Yes, si sign me up. Mark, uh, uh, what about you? Benefits of AI for consumers? Well, I think, um, I think the introduction and really the advancement of digital assistance is, uh, is a really exciting prospect. Um, you know, we demonstrated running, uh, you know, so-called Llama uh, to 7 billion parameter LLM in our vehicle, that 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 LLM specifically trained on the vehicle user man, right? And so you could just talk to the, the vehicle and say, hey, how do I change my tire, right? Uh, and it pulls up, instead of reading the 360 page user manual, which no offense, Jeff, but no OEM uh, makes it easy uh, to, to, to get through that. Um, the, uh, the relevant pages pop up on the dashboard and some brief verbal um, communication made by the computer of how do you change your tire, right? Um, you know, we, it was something that really resonated with um, the, the various different, whether it's press or, or OEMs uh, that came in. And, you know, for instance, one senior in, uh, individual was saying, oh, a third of our calls to our um, uh, call center are to ask how to use the buttons on the steering wheel. And so I said, okay, well, let's ask the car, uh, you know, how, how does this, uh, 
how do you use the buttons on the steering wheel? Sure enough, it comes back right to the page and gives a little overview of how to do it. So, I mean, to me, this is um, one of the things that it is just uh, fantastic for consumers. And then as well, we, we took that even further and you get the, the little light on the dashboard, right? Hey, car, what, what, uh, what is that light? It comes off, it pulls up the DTC code, tells you what it is, and then going to the cloud with um, some connected services can go into the OEM's uh, database, schedule a service appointment, give you an estimate of the cost, et cetera, et cetera. So really convenient uh, features um, that also you know, can help benefit uh, the OEM in being able to understand the health of their vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, super excited about that. Yeah, it's, it's incredible stuff. Fern, uh, what about you? Yeah, um, kind of building on the uh, what Jeff and Mark shared here, I'll take a slightly different angle to AI. In addition to personalization of the car and making it easier for our uh, for the drivers to understand uh, you know, all of the features and capabilities of the car, one of the other things that we've seen, um, especially with electric vehicles, is certainly getting a better understanding of the battery health, uh, state of health and state of charge, um, which ultimately translates to how much farther can you drive on this existing battery as it's charged today before I get stranded on the road? And nobody wants to, to, to experience that. Um, and the challenge is there's, there's so many factors that go into predicting how much you have, how many miles or how much range you have left in your battery. Um, and that is dependent on temperature, right? The, the temperature of your environment and uh, outside of the vehicle, uh, the terrain that you're driving on, you know, if it's really flat, if it's downhill, if it's going uphill, and then also the driver behavior itself. Are you someone that, you know, really accelerates and then, hits the brakes and, you know, consistently, or are you someone that drives at a consistent speed and allows the car to slow down on its own? All of that has an impact to uh, the state of health of the battery. And one of the things that is neat about AI and actually software defined vehicle is um, we demonstrated the concept of being able to, um, let's call it collect battery information real time, um, send it to the cloud, use AI to then start have a better accurate model of what that state of health and remaining charge would be on your car battery, really depending on what you're doing at that moment in time or how your driving style was over the past three hours, um, because that certainly can impact um, how how much you have left on, on that charge. And I think that's really neat because today, um, when you purchase a car, there is a model that gets implemented that estimates how much range you have left in your battery or even on your gas tank, right? Um, and then you go, wait, I thought I had, you know, 50 miles left. I've only driven five miles, but then it's all of a sudden thing I only have 10 miles left. Well, you may have been sitting in traffic. It may have been a really hot day and you've been cranking at the AC inside in order to cool the car down. And that ultimately impacts um, what, what you have left. Um, AI can help um, the the system get smarter and more accurate and allow the driver to, to have more trust um, in, in the car system and be able to plan accordingly. So that's another angle to, to that AI piece. The other aspect, you know, driver and um, OEMs combined is uh, diagnostic capabilities, just getting smarter around um, what are some things that are starting to fail or exhibiting uh, leading indicators of a potential failure out in time? And is that something that we can warn drivers ahead of time? Is that data that the OEMs can then collect, um, use AI to then better accurately model um, the longevity, the quality, or even how the systems are designed in order to, be, uh, to provide a much better experience uh, for, for the driver? That's exciting stuff. So, so Fern, you had just mentioned uh, um, in that last uh, answer, uh, electrification. And I want to double click on that maybe a little bit, because obviously this industry mm -hmm. is uh, very hyper focused right now on the electrification mm -hmm. transformation. And so I'm wondering if there aren't some 
um, synergies between some of the trends we've been talking about today and electrification? Is there anything about electrification or electrified platform that, that provides us perhaps an opportunity to advance or even accelerate uh, some of these other technologies? And so maybe Fern, we can stick with you to start um, before we move on to the others. Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, what's really interesting um, about electrification and software-defined vehicle, if I may, is um, the, uh, the, the movement towards electrification of vehicles is really challenging the way OEMs look at the vehicle architecture in order to implement it. And in some cases, it's a blank canvas to start with, well, if I didn't have to worry about a combustion engine, how would I go about building an art and, and a vehicle? And then you layer on the concept of software defined vehicle or centralization of the car uh, architecture. Uh, that is now opening our ideas up, uh, you know, the minds of, of, of innovate, innovators across the world on automotive is what else can we do differently? So I see that certainly accelerating uh, the adoption of new technology within vehicles. Um, I never thought I would ever make this uh, comparison, but um, it, the the speed at, of which the new technology is being implemented in a car is almost very similar to how smartphones were um, many, many years ago, where uh, the, who would have thought that, you know, I'm trying to remember when smartphones came about, maybe over 20 years ago, you were using a phone to make phone calls. Um, and then today we use our phones for everything. We use our phones to pay, we use our phones to figure out where to go, we use our phones to figure to take pictures, to take videos, right? Um, I think the car is moving in that direction and you see all of this new innovation and ideas coming in. And so when you talk about what um, some of these synergies between technology and vehicle electrification, the concept of ele that, that the electric vehicle platform, because OEMs can start from a clean slate in some cases, I think it's really accelerating this. You have uh, car OEMs who have demonstrated seat massagers um, in cars, uh, you know, um, and just, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the more far-fetched ones um, that, that you, you start, you never thought you'd see in a vehicle or even the ability for cars to no longer just move forwards and backwards and having to turn right according to the wheel. You now have um, cars that can control all, all four wheels independently, which allows cars to move diagonally uh, at a 90 degree angle. And so I think the possibilities are endless. Um, and with that comes a lot of technology synergy. Yeah, Mark, what about you? What do you think? Well, I, I think um, picking up on Fern's comment in terms of clean slate, right? I think what 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 we've seen um, in the places that 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 we heavily contribute to, um, the the tier ones and the OEMs are are definitely taking much more of a clean slate approach, um, trying to streamline the electrical. Um, architecture um, while they're bringing electrification into the, the vehicle. And so it's, uh, um, you know, a, a great way. And I think it's fair to say some of the most advanced uh, um, from, a, you know, my domain as cockpit or ADAS, some of the most uh, advanced uh, vehicles on the road are electric cars, I think partially due to that, uh, that clean slate approach. So. Yeah. Uh, Jeff? Sure. Uh, so as was mentioned, you know, when you're looking at electrification, it allows you to go back to the drawing board. Um, speaking for Honda, we've long had this philosophy of man maximum, machine minimum. It goes back uh, many, many decades. And you know, with electrification, it, it really allowed us to, to take that to the next level, to you know, not only create space for the individual and, and driving opportunities for the individual, but redesign the entire car in a new way. Uh, and relevant to, to our conversation here, when you're redesigning the architecture of a car, you're redesigning the technology of a car as well. And it allows any company such as Honda or, or others to look into some of these technologies that are being developed and implement them. And, you know, in, in some ways, it allows you to implement technologies that are not even possible on traditional gasoline or, or diesel powered engines. 
Yeah, that's that's really exciting. So um, as we wrap up our conversation here, I think we've got time for one one last question. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this specifically of, of Mark and, and Fern. Um, you know, it it struck me at CES this year that there was a lot of discussion around collaboration and partnership between mm -hmm. automakers and technology companies, including uh, semiconductor companies. And and I, I just want to take your temperature. Is, is that right? Was I seeing things the same way that you were seeing things? Is something happening here? Is that relationship changing? And, and if so, in your opinion, sort of how? Uh, maybe, Mark, we could start with you on this one. Sure. I mean, I, I, I think... Um... This trend has uh, been going on for a few years now, where there's uh, much more direct uh, engagement, direct conversations between semiconductor suppliers, which would traditionally be considered a tier two uh, in the system, to the to the OEMs as they um, try to take in and, and really control some of their um, let's call it destiny. Um, and you know that it's a it's a it's a clear um, trend um, to to play bringing more people together, and I think as well, you know, if you take a look at the ecosystem, um, it's uh, it's not just um, uh, a semiconductor company talking to an OEM, but it's uh, so bringing a whole ecosystem of solutions uh, um, together um, to advance uh, this. Let's call it co innovation in the marketplace. And, and Fern, what about you? Is that, is that your take as well? Yeah, um, I, I definitely agree with Mark in the sense that it's not a new concept, but I think it's coming to the forefront a lot more now, just given um, the bigger need for partnership between semiconductor suppliers, OEMs, um, software providers um, to come together to collaborate. What I would say has been the biggest shift in recent times within the automotive ecosystem has been the relationship between the OEM tier ones and semi suppliers, where it used to be, you know, somewhat linear between the OEM to tier one and tier one to semiconductor suppliers to now be more of a circular relationship where we're all talking together um, because there are, a, there, there's a lot of innovation that within the semiconductor space that can enable some of these new things that Jeff had mentioned from an OEM perspective and also giving them new ideas on, you know, how, how can they better leverage um, semiconductor technology as part of their vision uh, for, for the future? Uh, the content, semiconductor content in vehicles has continuously increased uh, year over year. And with that, the impact of semiconductor technology um, continues to increase um, in, in, in a vehicle. And, um, you know, for Texas Instruments, our, our focus is primarily on the semiconductor, the silicon, the hardware piece of it. And that's where we do have to partner with third parties um, who can then um, work on the software side of things to really extract the maximum capability our technology can offer for the OEM, you know, certainly we see OEMs um, who don't have expertise or deep technical expertise in semiconductors in the past that are now building up teams, um, partnering with us and partnering with third parties more and more alongside their uh, traditional tier one partners to really go figure out how we continue to accelerate innovation in vehicles. That's great. A, a lot of a lot of change um, for sure. Um, well, a unfortunately, lot. I think that um, that is all the time we have uh, for today. I want to thank uh, Jeff, Mark, Fern uh, for you joining us uh, for this important conversation. I want to thank all of those who tuned in uh, uh, to this conversation as well. Um, we're going to show a final video uh, as we close out here of all of the great uh, automotive technologies that the Alliance for Automotive Innovation members uh, showed at CES this year. But thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Heather.
So the key concept for the concept car basically is the personalization. And on top of that, uh, what we have brought in here is a 55 inch display, pillar to pillar display here, which is divided between the main and the passenger. Mm -hmm. A passenger display actually can have a privacy control so that the driver is not distracted. That's good because now the passenger can occupy himself exactly. or herself. The baby monitoring, by the way, is a critically important safety feature, exactly. right? You're monitoring the baby while you're in the car. You don't have to actually look backward and you know cause uh, some distraction there. Buy a car today, you will get a 300 pages uh, user manual. Oh my gosh, yes. And, and you, who reads that? Exactly. With the generative AI, you can actually talk to the assistant and in a conversational way and basically get uh, a help from the assistant. Hey, Snapdragon, I'm trying to adjust the steering wheel. How do I do that? You need to pull the lever down. You grip the steering wheel. Yeah, as you can see, the assistant basically got the summary of that. What is that alert on my dashboard? Problem appears. The battery charger coupler temperature too hot. So all these uh, diagnostic codes are available on the cap. Amazing. This is the Honda Zero Series Space Hub. So what you have here is a thin, energy-dense battery, which maximizes space for the people within the vehicle. The Honda Zero Series will be able to charge from 15% to 80% in 15 minutes. Oh yeah, that's fast aiming to have just 10% battery degradation after 10 years, which should wow. leave the market. It's huge. So this is the Honda Zero EV Series saloon concept. It's completely buttonless, right? So everything's touch screens. This is a stunning vehicle, both visually and technologically. According to Jeff at Honda, we can expect a production vehicle like this in 2026. Beautiful vehicle. Tell us a little bit about what's happening for BMW at CES. We have different uh, showcases here from in-vehicle experiences to uh, augmented reality experiences. This is a teleoperation concept vehicle, meaning a remote driver drives a vehicle over a cellular network. You get in touch with a person sitting in a call center and then he takes over control and then he drives the vehicle from the entrance of that building to the entrance of the car park, parking the car somewhere. I'm coming up to the spot where I'm gonna park the car, pulling in. This is amazing. What I love about Harman is infotainment, excellence, great audio, but groundbreaking, cutting edge safety and cognitive awareness technologies. And we are able to really understand whether, even if you have your eyes on the road, whether you are really concentrated on what's happening. They can get information on their head unit about where to charge their vehicle, information from the weather channel. And what's beautiful about it is it's all integrated into one suite of technologies. And so Harman's offering this to car companies to be able to, to build their own systems that are integrated in this way. What's going on for yeah. Mercedes here at CES? First and foremost for us right now is the focus on the customer experience and finding ways to drive forward technology and innovation, maps and our operating systems in the car. The new CLA class, it's built on an all electric architecture. Right now the vehicle's rated for over 400 miles electric range. Wow. Of course, this is the concept. This is where we're pushing forward electrification in the market. Over 200 miles can be charged in 15 minutes. That's Which tremendous. that's really a big game changer when we're looking at right. how to get more customers into an electric vehicle, feel comfortable with driving long distances in their electric vehicle. This is the future of Mercedes. I love it. We're watching a parking demonstration, a vehicle that is actually moving around a parking lot and about to park itself. Aptiv's taking a very integrated approach with multiple technologies. They're looking at cameras and radar and LiDAR into a complete holistic system of perceptions. Light, darkness, weather, fog, and the ability to integrate all of those sensing and perception capabilities into one solution for OEM customers is really great. And what they're also doing is they're able to integrate that into software, into one stack, and then up into the cloud. We're excited to be part of CES. So we have a big footprint with our heavy duty industrial, Mobis, and we're looking to the future. 
We have 42 Dot, which is a software company that looks at software-defined vehicles with individual modular systems on a high-speed bus that goes around the vehicle. Hyundai is all about hydrogen. So this is the converter that can take the hydrogen through its process, create the electrification with storage. So wow. this provides high DC charging to fuel the vehicles. We at the Alliance for Automotive Innovation are going to welcome BinFast as our first pure play battery electric vehicle manufacturer joining the Alliance. Together with other members of the Alliance, we would like to make a positive impact on the sustainable mobility of the world. There's a tremendous opportunity in partnership between technology leaders like VinFast and government to create the right environment for success. So what we have at CES is we have a new e-drive that is, for us, is a significant improvement relative to the CO2 and the package space and the requirements. We're, we're reducing the aluminum content, we're reducing the CO2. We came out with an announcement this week is our impairment detection sensing. It's a breath analyzer, if you will, while at the same time watching the face. So we kind of have a dual sensor combination. There's a lot of neat things going on here. Here we are at LG. What you see behind me is an integrated platform that brings together many of their businesses focused on mobility. It's not only battery development and supporting more miles on an electric charge, but it's also about wireless battery management and integration with other electronic systems in the vehicle. We're at Texas Instruments here at CES. One of the things that they're working on is radar to detect people inside the vehicle. Every year, small children die because they're left in a car that overheats great technology that will definitely save lives. We're looking now at different new different applications like uh, dynamic ground projection where you can actually communicate to pedestrians via projection on the floor. The main adoption has been uh, coming from the safety perspective. When you talk about digitalization, you talk about a vehicle, it is now becoming a computer on wheels. Yes. And you're taking a lot of legacy mechanical systems and making them electrical. Braking systems, steering systems, it's not just an EV, it's the entire infrastructure around the vehicle is also being digitalized. We provide a lot of safe products, dependable electronics being our major offering. 